drinking and eating. Uh, but I don't care. Now, are we starting now? Oh, yes. So welcome back. We're back. And I've got a coffee. And uh, if you want to talk to me after this session, that's fine. I think I've just about ironed out all the workshops, maybe. It's been very... I was playing golf last, year, last week and the week before. And I was getting phone calls on the, wasn't I, on the, the ninth hole where I was almost going to par the par five. And Seb rang me up and said, all these students are contacting me. And I said, that's no good. I'm just about to putt for a par. <laughs> and I, I got a bogey. I got a bogey. I, 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 I was up till two o'clock in the morning replying up in Yarrawonga. Anyway. Enough of that. We're back to the, the things that matter with everybody associated with PATH, and that's inflammation. So I've introduced you to the term exudate. Now, exudate is the fluid that accumulates in an inflammatory response, and that's what it contains. But as it says there, most importantly, leukocytes. Now, we all know we've all gone through varying degrees of injury. You may not have realised it, but you have. And these exudates, serous, fibrinous, hemorrhagic, are going up in scale in, re in response to degrees of injury. And I think all of us would have experienced a serous exudate, a fibrinous exudate, you're going, what the hell is that, Brian? And a hemorrhagic exudate. You might think, oh, I might have an idea of what that actually is. So let's have a look at them and explain what the degrees of damage mean. So, and, oh, this, this last one is a suppurative or purulent exudate, which is mostly associated with bacterial infections, that last one. So another type of exudate, suppurative or purulent, that is usually to do with bacterial infections. But let's have a look at these. So, there's a bacterial infection swelling exudation due to be very good. Now, so... If we have a very mild injury, in podiatry you'll see people that will have blisters on their toes and, or blisters on their fingers, that is what's called an immediate transient permeability. So it's degree of leakage. So it's a very, very mild injury. And if we pop that blister, what colour is the fluid? Clear. So there's very little what in it. Do you think it's an exudate, so it must, it's very little white blood cells, and very little protein. And that's what makes it clear. So it's basically an ultrafiltrated plasma. And so if we damage the, and the mild injuries, histamine is released from the mast cells. Another substance called bradykinin, which you'll see in one of the videos, is generated in plasma. And that causes the contraction of the endothelial cells to come away and affect, yes, it only affects the venules. I should have asked you a question. So you, everyone says the capillaries are the things that are affected mostly in inflammations, but it's not. It's the small veins called venules. So for some reason, histamine has receptors on venules that causes the endothelial cells to contract to come away, and fluid escapes in very, very mild injuries. And that's why we only have a clear fluid. Not much protein comes out. So, you can probably guess that the next thing, what's going to come out in the exudate more? In a higher degree damage. No, yeah, but that's the, what about in the middle? Protein. Okay, you're going to have lots more protein. So, so that clear fluid is called a serous exudate. Serous clear, and we'll be using that term serous in other forms as well, but it's a clear exudate. Very little protein, very few white blood cells, it's an ultrafiltrated plasma. Viruses cause this type of serous exudate as well. So a viral infection can also cause this serous. They don't cause a pus. They don't, have a what, they don't have a neutrophil or polymorph response viruses. They actually have a lymphocyte response and the fluid that accumulates usually is clear or serous. 
Now, we've all gone to the beach or we've gone out in the sun. We haven't put sun protection on. And we think, oh, we, well, I'm doing all right today. I'm not going to get burnt. Oh. So, yep, and then you go home and then two hours later, boing. This is what happens. So initially, there's no damage, but accumulative over a number of hours, eventually what will happen is you get this effect. And as you can see here, what do you think the fluid in there has got lots of? Protein, yep. It's got lots of protein in that exudate. And there'll be white blood cells. There'll be more white blood cells than what was in the blister. And as you can see, there's a lot more redness. So this is what's called a delayed, prolonged vascular permeability or leakage. It doesn't happen straight away. There's a latent phase that will last maybe two hours or three hours after the event. So it's a, a more severe injury. This is something like sunburn, which I assume most of us have experienced. And the thing there is that the capillaries are also affected. The important thing, what hasn't been affected yet? What vessel? Arterioles, the smaller arteries. Okay. So usually in these mild to moderate injuries, it's only the venules first and then the venules and capillaries, but not the arterioles that are affected as far as permeability is concerned. So it can result in either a serious or more particularly if it's a, quite a large um, damage, we get this fibrinous exudate. Now, the next thing we have to talk about is fibrin or fibrinous exudate. And what we've got here on the right is a fibrinous exudate. And those little, if I got, no, I haven't got it yet. Have I got it yet? Come on, Brian. No. These little spindly shaped structures, that's fibrin. Now, this is where it's important that you go back to your physiology and look up the coagulation cascade. Because in the coagulation cascade, this protein fibrinogen in plasma gets converted to fibrin. And we've all, we all know what fibrin is because everyone's had scabs. And that's what the scab is. But you actually can form fibrin in, say, things like blisters or whatever where you've got a lot of protein or in traumatised tissue. So that fibrinogen in the coagulation cascade gets converted to fibrin through the activation of that coagulation cascade. And we form this semi-fiber-like structure called fibrin. So you'll get a question on your exam or in your workshop, and I'm going to ask you what forms fibrin. And I'll put fibroblasts at the top, and most of you will put that, but you'll be wrong. Fibrin is produced from plasma, not from cells. And it's an integral, it's a really important protein, this fibrin. Very important, temporary, fiber-like protein. And as you see, advantages. White blood cells can move along them. So those polymorphs can move along the fibrin. It restricts movement of bacteria, the fibrin itself. So bacteria, it's very difficult for them to move through it. And the main, this is all the basis of next week. It's the basis for repair in tissues. If we don't have fibrin, we won't go through the healing or repair response. So that's why it's crucial. However, fibrin can also be a disadvantage. Can pro if we have fibrin there and we can't get rid of it, it will keep stimulating the inflammatory response. And this big one here coming up, if my thing click it, I think my battery's running out. Oh, it has, it's run out, hasn't it? Oh, it always does that. When it gets to overuse, I'll have to do it manually. Okay, sorry. Oh, no, there it is. Came back. We can form what are called adhesions. Now, you've probably heard of the term adhesion before and you may not know what it is, but it's basically scar tissue that links tissue together that shouldn't. So if we have 
fibrin that persists, we will stimulate the formation of scar tissue and we will link tissue together. We're going to do this later, so don't worry too much about that straight away. So blowing that up, this is a fibrin exudate. There's your fibrin, there are your polymorphs. And that fibrin exudate does all those things that we just did before in relation to advantages and disadvantages. But eventually, hopefully, we can get rid of this fibrin exudate. And as it says there, if the fibrin exudates persist, we get these things called adhesions. So we can get scar tissue linking other tissues together, and that can cause real problems. Look, we'll do this in far more detail next week. So what we're showing here is a fibrin exudate within a pericardial cavity. So the pericardial sac has been cut open. This is the heart, and this is the pericardium here. And this is a fibrin exudate. So if we don't get rid of that, that can actually get converted to scar tissue. But as I said, we're talking more about that next week. And there is the formation of scar tissue. So, and that's between the lung and the uh, within the pleura, that is, be, uh, yeah, outside of the lung, we can form these things called pleural adhesions. And as you'll see next week, Derek Padstow in your in your uh, cumulative case study, and I'll fill you in because I'm, I'm going to go to all the workshops initially, but I'll fill you in about the Padstows and on what you're expected to know about them. So we'll see that this can cause real problems, and as I said, we will talk about this in much more detail next week. Now, all of us have experienced this last one, which is a severe injury, where I think this person... That's a very weird spot there. I'm not... I think it's the butt. Oh, I'm not sure. Chris, you're an anatomist. Um, I reckon it's the hamstring or is it the arm? Come on. I oh, still can't work it out. It is the arm? Oh, it's the bicep. Yeah, I'm glad it's the bicep. Um, I'm very, very glad it's the bicep and not the, uh, the thigh. Anyway. Um, Here we have a sprained ankle, and here we have a traumatised eye. So basically everyone's experienced this. This is a bruise or a hematoma. And so what's happened is that we get severe injury, death of endothelial cells, leakage from all vessels, including arterioles. And so we get not only a fibrinous exudate, we will also get a hemorrhagic exudate. So in that exudate before, the gaps weren't large enough for red blood cells to get out. But here, red blood cells can actually get out and get into the interstitial tissue, and we have a bruise or a hematoma. So it's just a more severe injury. That's a beauty, isn't it? Look at that. It's a very severe blister from Roundup. So don't put Roundup on your skin, obviously. Not a good thing. The last exudate which I will talk about is pus, or a purulent or suppurative exudate. So again, you can, everyone ready? You've got a suppurative exudate or purulent exudate, or everyone just calls it pus. Let's just call it pus. And I'm glad we've all had lunch. Now, because talking about pus is not a great thing. So what we've got here is a picture on the left and all of these cells are what you reckon they are. All those little dots. Yeah, they're neutrophils. In most cases of pus, there are a very small proportion of injuries where you may form pus without bacteria, but the vast majority of uh, incidences where you have pus, bacteria cause the pus. And it's white because of the so much white blood cells and protein. Large amounts of protein in pus. And the really bad thing about having too much pus is, yes, there will also be fibrin in it, and you can end up forming adhesions 
again through having a suppurative or purulent exudate that is pus. We're going to be looking at meningitis in our workshop next week and there's pus there and you can probably imagine and we'll talk about this later on why having an inflammation of your brain or your meninges would be a big problem. You can probably work out why, I think. And from your cardinal signs of inflammation. Ah, which one? Your cardinal sign of inflammation, which one would be the worst one associated with a meningitis of your car five cardinal signs of inflammation that we've just done? Swelling. Excellent. Now, most people, yeah, everybody's had an abscess. You know you have? You have? If you haven't had pimples, you're very lucky because a, a pimple is the simplest abscess but we can have large abscesses like this. And what, what I want you to do is look at the next video coming up on the formation of an abscess because that is really important in describing the formation of scar tissue. Because what we do is that we form a wall around the infection and we form collagen or scar tissue around that infection. So in your first workshop, that you're doing this week, you will see that I've given you the clue abscess. What does that always signify? Bacteria. So it always signifies bacteria. So as soon as you see abscess, it, it means bacteria because you're forming a wall to try and wall off that infection. To get rid of the excess fluid, most of you probably have realised that yes, we get rid of excess fluid by lymphatics. Sometimes, well, a lot of the times, however, is that if you damage your lymphatics, your lymphatic vessel, you cannot get rid of it. So it's very important that we actually can generate new lymphatics in, an, in the healing response to try and get rid of the excess fluid. But in most cases, we can get rid of excess fluid through lymphatic drainage. So what I just went through there were the different degrees of damage in inflammation. What I'll do now is talk about the different cell types and which come first and which come second. Well, we've already alluded to that the polymorphs are the major white blood cell involved in acute inflammation. And so early on in inflammatory response, the neutrophils are the first to go to the area of damage and then the macrophages come in later. So that's the first thing you have to know. So all, in all pathologies, what you have to understand is actually what is actually happening within that tissue. What is actually occurring in a, a sequential event? And this is what we're going to be doing very shortly, going through the sequential stages of what's actually happening within the tissue within acute inflammation. So you haven't got this picture, but, and I don't know why I haven't put it up because I don't care about copyright too much, but anyway, um, what we've got here is muscle and early, it's inflamed skeletal muscle. I think it's skeletal. I think it is. Maybe, yeah, yeah, I think it is, yep. Yeah. And all these purple dots signify neutrophils, mostly. There will be also nuclei from fibroblasts and your muscle cells as well. So early on we have edema, that's an increase in permeability. Neutrophils will follow within, into the tissue from the blood vessels. And as you can see, there's this latent phase of macrophages sustaining. And as you can see here, look, look at it, look. Neutrophils aren't there in the tissue after around about two and a half days. They're gone. So neutrophils will only be in tissue in inflammation within the first few days and then macrophages later on. However, neutrophils can persist in things like bacterial infections because of pus. So macrophages then come later. And you have to be really good histopathologists to actually point out what a macrophage is here. Uh, I can't do it. There are probably some of those in there, but yeah, there's no neutrophils in there, by the way, on the right. 
Okay, so I'm going to review all these, and this is what we're going to go through now. Um, I don't particularly care for all of these terms. Maybe immigration is probably a good one. Chemotaxis is a good one. Phagocytosis, margination and pavementing, nah, I don't care. But we'll, I'll, I'll describe them, and what we're going to do is just talk about the white blood cell events and the vascular events associated with the acute, most acute inflammatory responses. Okay, you ready? Yes, Brian, I'm ready. Let's go. Okay, so I've drawn this. This is me, mine, and it is a venule. Now, a venule is a small vein. And as we know from all inflammations, the venule is the one that is affected in all inflammations, mild ones, moderate ones, and severe ones. And what it's showing here, if we have a look, there are your endothelial cells. So we've got six endothelial cells there, See, one, two, but I've cut it out, so we've probably got more, and that's causing a tube, which is a small vein or venule. Now, these are your cell junctions. Everyone's got that? And does everyone know that all blood vessels sit on what's called a basement membrane? Does everyone know, has everyone heard of a basement membrane before? Sort of. Do you know what it does? Basement and what's it made of? No? Nope. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. I'll try to. Basement membrane. The endothelial cell produces the basement membrane. Okay. And it's a type of collagen. And it's a, what's called a type 4 collagen. Its main function, what do you think its function is then? I've told you it's collagen type 4. What would be one function of collagen type 4 or collagen in general? Connective tissue, yep. So you're connecting to other tissues through this basement membrane. That's one function, but it's not its main function. Anyone want to have a, has it a guess on what its main function might be? Rougeau by Gorbagel? Sorry? No, it doesn't nourish the cells, no. No. Hey? Filtration! Oh, excellent. Excellent. Oh, filtration. That's the first time in 29 years that I've had that before. Well done. It acts as a filter. Filters things. It, well, it doesn't allow things to go to and fro. It's a semi-permeable type structure. Think of it as a sieve, a selective sieve. So it allows certain things out, but it doesn't allow all things out. And so that's really important, okay? So it's very selective. And we'll be talking about the basement membrane a little bit later when we talk about diabetes, because what we'll find is that in poorly treated diabetes, that basement membrane actually gets thicker, and that causes problems. Go! Oh! Brian, come back. Right, so, emphasize, no inflammation, normal blood flow. So what I'm trying to, what type of blood flow, what type of flow is this called? In normal vessels where you get the, the, the hang, hang, oh, hang, oh, you got it right, Fiona. I better explain it first. Where the cells are in the middle, and then you've got the plasma on the outside. What's that called, Fiona? Laminar flow. Have everyone heard of laminar flow before? Mm -hmm. you, you should have in, in physiology. You should have heard of laminar flow. So what we've got there is laminar flow with the cells in the middle and the plasma on the outside. I've put in the fibroblasts and the mast cells, you notice, underneath. So, okay, so now we're going to get an injury. So we've got an injury down here. That injury could be injury, as in trauma, or it could be a bacteria. Oh, here we go. Cells injured, dying, dead, or bacteria. So, factors are released from that injury. And as it says there, it says chemotactic factors and other mediators. You don't even know what that means yet. But as you'll find out, chemotactic factors are factors that are attract, usually, white blood cells to the injury. 
and I'll define what chemotaxis is very shortly. But on the injury, you also release mediators from, yes, mast cells, but you probably also release mediators from fibroblasts as well because they're going to be damaged as well. But the mast cell is the important one. So what's going to be released from mast cells mainly? Histamine. Good. And others, as you'll see, if you do some more reading. I'll put my bulleted notes up for this after this session. Ah, so we get acute inflammation now. So the, the red arrow signifies increase in blood flow. What have I done incorrectly in this diagram? Naughty Brian. What I, I should and I, I didn't even realise when I did it, but it, the vessel hasn't dilated, has it? No. It should have got bigger, but Brian, you didn't do it. But anyway, I, I should, I couldn't be bothered changing it. Anyway, <laughs> so the, the vessel should have dilated because that's what it says, vasodilatation, doesn't it? So increase in blood flow. But is that an active dilatation or a passive dilatation? Can you remember what I did before? It, it's passive. Where's the active dilatation occurring? In your arterioles, which are supplying your capillaries, which then go to your venules. Okay? So the active dilatation from these mediators have actually opened up the arterioles first. That engorges the capillaries and then the venules to dilate passively. Got it? So, and we engorge the vessel with white and red blood cells, mostly red blood cells because we know that red blood cells make up most of our blood. And their vasodilatation, all these things can cause vasodilatation, histamine, bradykine, prostaglandins, and all these things. Have a look at the video which is coming up in regards to chemical mediators. So, then you get an increase in permeability, meaning fluid goes out of the vessels into the interstitial tissues. How does it do that? It mainly does it via this mechanism. And as you can see there, histamine also contributes to the increase in permeability, as do other factors. The endothelial cells contract to form large gaps between the cells. And so what happens is fluid escapes. Now, the blood flow then slows. And this is easy, right? Think, like, if you mix, well, we'll, we'll say, tre you know, treacle or honey. We'll say honey because you probably don't know what treacle is. Honey and water. Think of honey as the cells and water as the plasma, Okay. Now, if you put that in a tube and you get rid of the water, what's going to happen to the viscosity of your fluid when you get rid of the water? It increases, meaning the blood, the flow will slow. So you have to think that when you lose that fluid, the viscosity of the blood increases and the blood flow slows. Now, you need the blood flow to slow because you want, need to get the white blood cells out into the interstitial tissue. If it doesn't slow, that is the blood flow, the white blood cells can't get out. So they, the blood flow needs to slow down, and that is what's happening. So now we get what's called neutrophil migration due to chemotactic factors released from this injury. So this injury is releasing these factors which are attracting, unbelievably, just the neutrophils to start off with. And so let's have a look. Here we go. I spent hours doing this. You ready? Oh, and we'll go back. We'll go back. It was hours. Right here. So, Remember, the white blood cells initially are in the middle, axial flow, and then the blood flow slows, and then 
Oh, well, I'm going back with Celia. Come on, you idiot. Now, I'm talking to myself. Now, neutrophils move from the central position to the vessel, and that's called margination. Who cares? And then they adhere to the endothelium. So that it adheres to that endothelial cell, right? And this is all to do with factors that are released from the injury. They then get it moved, and this is called pavementing, lining up alongside each other. Who cares? But, and they crawl, neutrophils squeeze through the gaps, right? And this is emigration. That's all right. I, I'll, I'll, I think emigration's fine, because it actually tells you what they're doing. So they emigrate between the gaps of the endothelial cells, right? And so they're attracted, they're attracted, and bang, the, they go to the dead and dying cells or the bacteria, and they engulf them and break them down. So you can see that neutrophils eliminate foreign agents and or dead and neutrophils die within two to three days. We just told you that. Macrophages take over. So when, when neutrophils die, they release factors which are chemotactic for macrophages. So it's when the neutrophils are actually dying, they stimulate the, the macrophages to go to the area. So there's immigration. Acute inflammation, where a neutrophil, two, is squeezing through the gaps between the endothelial cell and going to the outside towards the injured tissue and large gaps amid endothelial cells. Ah, now, I didn't do this. A previous colleague did this. And this is showing, this stuff here is what's called C5A, which is a component of complement and is a chemotactic factor. Have a look at the uh, videos when I sh release them to you. And this is the injured tissue. So the injured tissue is reforming or stimulating the formation of this uh, hello? Um, forming this, this uh, factor called C5A and so, ready. Now this, oh, this is supposed to be a neutrophil. Supposed, this is not mine by the way, but it's good. Watch. So you go to a bit of and then and then so go okay. So, chemotactic factors are uh, factors that are released which stimulate the movement of cells along a chemical gradient. And so, the higher the concentration of chemotactic factor, the more quickly the cell will migrate. So, if you're a cell up the back there, and I'm releasing chemotactic factors, you're going to move very slowly compared to somebody, some of the cells down here because they will move quicker because the concentration of the chemotactic factor is greater down here. Does that make sense? So that's what chemotaxis is all about. And it's usually white blood cells, but we'll see that fibroblasts also can go via what's called chemotaxis, the movement of cells along a chemical gradient. Phagocytosis will finally occur either in neutrophils or macrophages. It's, it says here bacterium, but I've put an asterisk, and that can be can any be any foreign invader, extracellular virus, parasite, or even dead and native tissue debris. And so we go and break it down and kill off the bacteria or break down various proteins that are associated with foreign invaders. And so that is phagocytosis, which I think most of you have probably come across anyway. And we, as you can see, I'm not going to go into too much detail. You don't need to know uh, various chemical, uh, biochemical pathways associated with that. Just know that enzymes are released to degrade most things. Okay, so let's just go through it. So with pathology, you need to know the sequences of events that occur in various tissue injuries or in inflammations or in diseases. And this is what's happening in the acute inflammatory response. You ready? So, excuse me, well, I, I need to have a drink. So, we get tissue injury from trauma or bacteria. We've done all this, so we're just going over it. We get dilatation, active dilatation of arterioles due to the release of substances like histamine, but also nerve uh, 
damage, which can stimulate arterial dilatation. So you can use the term dilation or dilatation. It doesn't matter. They're the same thing. You increase your blood flow. Your other vessels will increase, uh, dil they'll dilate as well. You'll get an increase in permeability due to the cells, endothelial cells contracting. Plasma and plasma proteins move out of the blood vessels to accumulate in tissue. The blood flow slows due to the loss of plasma. You get emigration of the neutrophils between the gaps into the interstitial due to chemotactic factors released from the injury site. So remember, it could be a bacteria, it could be dead and dying tissue, it could be anything that's causing damage. You get phagocytosis, a bacteria, first by neutrophils, and then by they die off two to three days, and then macrophages recruit it and continue the phagocytic process. And yep, come on, I think the battery's just about, oh, there it is and we end up hopefully getting towards healing, which we'll be talking about next week. So you can see there that all of these things happen, even in the mildest of injuries where we... But remember, we usually have to kill cells to actually go through this process. Okay. Well, self-directed learning. Don't worry too much. Oh, no, well, yes... My bulletin notes will, will have all of this there, so you can have a look at that, and we'll also have a look at it in our workshop next week. So I'll put up next week's workshop very, very soon. Okay? I don't want to overload you. You're already overloading me already, Brian. <laughs> but uh, make sure that you do that. Okay, now, as I said, I used to do immunopathology, but... I decided that it was a waste of time because students were learning things that were far too detailed to know in, in regards to uh, knowing about things that happen normally. So what I've do, I've condensed this down to try and explain, yes, now we all know that we get an immune response when we come into contact with things like viruses or bacteria, but there are other things that cause immune responses. The emphasis that I'm putting here, lymphocytes are your major white blood cells involved in immune responses. Most immune responses are beneficial, however, many instigate inflammation. And we've all experienced it. We've all, who, everyone, who, who experiences hay fever? Most, you'll find that 50% of the population or more will have experienced hay fever. Now, hay fever, is due to an immune response. And it's not a good thing. Most immune responses are good. That is, they protect us against viruses and bacteria. But someone's put it, but Brian, haven't we got inflammation? Won't that take care of things like bacteria and viruses? The answer is no. Because sometimes we need a backup and the immune response is that backup. So we go through the acute inflammatory response. Yes, we might get rid of the bacteria, but as we'll see, and hopefully, we will create a memory to that bacteria or virus for another time, and then we can get rid of the virus or bacteria quite easily on the second challenge to the foreign invader. But in a lot of cases, we set up inflammatory responses or hypersensitivity reactions as well. Okay. Now, we've mentioned lymphocytes before. Now, there are various types of lymphocytes. There are B cells, and B cells come from bone marrow. And as it says there, they transform into plasma cells which produce antibodies against antigens in the extracellular fluid, and those antigens can be something like bacteria. So we have B cells which eventually will form into plasma cells, which will then form antibodies, attach to antigens, and hopefully get rid of things such as bacteria. We have T cells, which are... Anyone can tell me where T cells are derived from? Thymus, well done. Someone's, uh, excellent. Thymus, not thyroid, but thymus. 
and all of you in the audience, I know, how old are you? Um, most of you are 19, are you? No, yeah, I wish too, but um, most of you be 19. You probably still have a thymus of some sort. I definitely don't have a thymus. Gone years ago. Um, but where do you think we store most of our B and T cells? Not in the bone marrow, no. Where do you think we store most of our B and T cells? In the lymph nodes. Well done. So they're there for any infection that we might have, whether it be virus or bacteria. We have helper cells. Now, this, I'm giving you this information because if you're going to read some of the PATH textbooks, they might come up with these, words, these, these terms. Helper T cell, really important cell. There are subsets. Now, does anyone know what the helper cell, the importance of the helper cell in a certain disease? Anyone? Yeah, it does act, but what, what disease which specifically attacks helper cells? HIV. HIV. Well done, HIV. So, I'm not going to say HIV virus because I'll be saying human immunodeficiency virus virus. So HIV. HIV specifically attacks that protein CD4+, plus, which is only found on helper, helper T cells. So if we knock out the helper cell, as we do in untreated AIDS, you'll see, and we'll come into the next diagram, why people have an increased risk of infection and also the formation of cancer as well. There are other T cells called cytotoxic T cells, and their good name, as is helper, as we'll see, cytotoxic T cells kill cells where the antigen is contained within the cell. So We'll just go through the flow diagram very shortly. And the other ones that we have are called natural killer cells, and they're also lymphocytes as well. But they're stupid cells. They have to be told what to do. Well, cytotoxic T cells, yes, they get told what to do, but they're also important in killing things. So what has this all got to do with inflammation? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the two, what's called the two specific adaptive immune responses, which is a normal immune response. That is, what I'm going to tell you now is good, but the hypersensitivity thing is what is bad. That is causing inflammation. So we have two immune responses. The antibody-mediated immune response where we form antibodies. Now, the antigen that is the foreign, usually protein, is found in the extracellular fluid. It can be a bacteria, non-functioning virus, fungus, parasites, anything in the extracellular fluid that's foreign. What we do, the macrophage engulfs it, B cell attaches to it, the macrophages said what are called process and present the antigen to a helper cell. The helper cell help the B cells to proliferate, transform into plasma cells and memory B cells for another day. That is the basis for vaccination. The memory B cells are there for another day. The plasma cells produces antibodies, and there are your four main antibodies. And I'll emphasize again, most of these, particularly the ones on the left, are very, very good. They get rid of things. They protect us against things. The one on the right, IgE, tends not to be very good. It tends to be associated with allergies. And this is the hypersensitivity reaction. So there'll be a video coming up on hypersensitivity reaction. The first one is your type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, which most of us have experienced. So when we produce immunoglobulin E, which is an antibody, we get an allergic response, binds to mast cells, release mediators, generates inflammation. So we can die from this, say, in allergic asthma or in allergies to... Uh, seafood or peanuts. Hello there. What the hell's that? Oh, that oh, sorry, Chris. And uh, so you can view that on video coming up, that type 1 hypersensitivity. You can also view, now, as I said, most of the ones on the left are good, but they can also cause hypersensitivity reactions. 
So type 2 and type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. The big thing that I want you to understand is that when an antibody binds to an antigen, it activates this thing called the complement cascade. Now, complement is very similar to the coagulation cascade. It's found in plasma, but it is in very important in inflammation, and it generates inflammation. So, again, have a look at the video on hypersensitivities. It explains these two later. So that's what's called the antibody-mediated immune response. Mostly good, but can be bad when we form antibodies to generate inflammations in tissues. And we need to know that because we're going to be looking at other uh, pathologies later on, like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, all have an immune hypersensitivity reaction involved in them. Finally, yes, I'm going to do it. Well done, Brian. Now, the other adaptive or specific immune response is called the cell-mediated immune response. Now, instead of the antigen being within the extracellular fluid, the foreign substance or protein is within our cells, our own cells. So things like functioning viruses. So remember, viruses will only function within cells. They exist outside of cells, but they don't function within cells. Precancerous cells, cancerous cells, cell bacteria within cells, and that's the tuberculosis bacteria, and other proteins as well. Okay, let's have a look. So we actually don't form antibodies to kill cells in this particular case. The macrophages, same thing, process that presents antigen 2, helper cell, cytotoxic T. Helper cell helps cytotoxic T to proliferate, and we help a cell also helps natural killer cells and macrophages. They seek out, that is the cytotoxic T cell, seeks out and attaches to the changed cells and they kill the changed cells. So that's how we get rid of... That's, because all you are mostly young, most of you do not have cancer because you go through this process of killing your changed cells through this process. It's called immune surveillance. And that's how we get rid of cancer cells, by this process. As we get older, this gets a little bit lower, and so the cancer rate goes up. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. We have a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. That's a type 4. It's a cell-mediated. This, as you can see, no antibodies formed here at all. So there they are. If I showed you that from the start, you would not know. So I've just. So please look at the hypersensitivity videos, which I'll put up, just to uh, clarify what those hypersensitivity reactions are. So that what they are are immune responses that cause tissue damaging effects. That is inflammation. Okay. So next week or. Oh, the next lot of videos will have the sequels to this acute inflammation and I will put them up soon, not straight away, because I need you to absorb that first. But they will, this is what we're going to... And next week, we will be doing healing in a face-to-face. -face. Thank you very much for your attention and I will see you all at workshops this week, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, you do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you don't have to, as long as you're able to work with them, and because you'll be in a team. Okay. Yeah. So, so we can do them on our laptops. Yes. 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 No. 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 You don't have to print. You don't have to print. If you can do it without printing, excellent. All right. Yeah. No worries. Hi. Just a question. Yes. Um, yeah. I committed to a shift at work. Oh, this right. Thursday is a one-off. I can. Oh, okay. I can still make the lab. I just will have to leave about twenty minutes early. Oh no, that's good. Is the one you're doing a quiz? What, what, in what, 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 what I'm, yeah, what I'm trying to do is, that, and everyone will be relieved, is that the, the thing is we're only going to probably do the workshop for an hour and a half. Okay. Look, an hour every and a half is every workshop will only. I'm going to put in a stipulation that it goes for an hour and a half.
Okay. Because last year we only we had one hour ones and they were too short. So we're having one and a half hours. So I can leave yeah. at 10.30? No problem. Cool, I can make it work on time. No worries. George. Hello, how are you? Yes, how are you? Thank you so much.